Hello and welcome to CAP Academy. Today we're going to be going over the scanning and design workflow for removable partial dentures in 3Shape. I'm going to start off a new case and fill out our general info. For RPDs, it doesn't matter what tooth number you select as long as you select something on the arch you plan on working on. So I can choose a random tooth number on this upper arch, click removable, and it adds that to this entire jaw. You do also have an extra option where you can make one of the teeth as a pontic, and it will be part of the frame in the same material. You'd select that tooth and add anatomy, and just make sure it's set up as the pontic option. But for this case, I'm going to leave it just as the framework itself. For scan settings, I do have a physical model, but I don't have an opposing, so I'm going to turn that off and go straight into the scanning workflow. For scanning, it's not a whole lot different than prep cases, but there are some extra options that you'll want to take advantage of depending on what model scanner you have. For RPDs, it's usually helpful to have texture scanning on so that you can capture any drawings or marks that have been made on the model that give you a better idea of where everything needs to pl be uh, placed. So I'm going to go into the settings gear and make sure that scan texture is on. Just keep in mind that this will only be available if you have a D800 or higher scanner or an E2 or higher scanner and different models will have either black and white or color texture available. But with all of those options, it's just this one checkbox. As long as that's on, I'll continue next, and it'll go through its scanning workflow. There is no preview scan for RPDs or other removable cases. It's just going to go straight into a detail scan of the entire model, so it will take a little bit longer than most quadrants or prep cases. After the scan is complete, you can take a look around, and if you can't see the acquired texture, just make sure to toggle this little color wheel on or off to make that visible. One thing to note about all removable cases is that you generally don't want to trim the models or trim the scan data because of a way that it tries to close it. After we're finished at this step, what it's going to do is try and close the underside so it's no longer open like we see it here. And if I were to do some trimming, let's say I've trimmed away some of the stonework, just getting rid of some of those excess pieces, what the software is going to try to do sometimes is close this with a flat edge which sometimes is going to cut straight through the palette because the palette is oftentimes deeper than these edges. So in order to avoid having a little slab of, uh, of space filled into the palette, I'm just going to avoid the trimming altogether. And here we see our final result where the base is closed. Now that the scanning is complete, I'll continue forward into design. The first step of setting up this, uh, this RPD is choosing our insertion direction and making sure that Everywhere that we want to clasp is undercut, however much we need. To see this a little bit better, I am going to have to toggle back and forth between this texture scan and the normal scan, just so that I can see where the undercuts are and how undercut they are based on this color chart. 
So ideally, if possible, I'd want to have all of the clasps in the yellow regions. Just barely undercut, but not so tight that it hurts to remove it. It's come up with an insertion direction automatically, just based on the shape of my scan. But I can modify this as needed by using these arrow keys. So I can move it left or right, and just keep in mind that these arrows will vary depending on where I'm looking from at the time. In addition, if you need to make more specific changes, you can adjust how much of a change happens with each click. So let's say I bump it down to one degree, so now it's making just a small adjustment with each click. The last thing to note is this blockout angle. So in addition to a parallel blockout, parallel to our insertion direction, it's just adding an extra three degrees all the way around, so it'll add an extra kind of fan out on either side. But three degrees is typical for that, so I'm going to leave that at the default and continue next. Now we can see the block out that it's applied based on that insertion direction. And I'm going to move the slider a little bit further up so I can see it easier. Now that it's added the block out, I need to take away some of those regions. So I'm going to use the minus tool and pull up my texture scan so I can take away wherever I need to add a clasp. So we'll just use minus on those sections. And just like before, I'm not going to stick to one view. I'm going to keep toggling back and forth between texture and non-texture so I can see how undercut these different areas are. After I've reduced all the areas I plan on adding clasps, I am going to go back in with the smooth tool and just kind of smooth out these edges that I made, especially on areas where I see some of the orange undercuts, because that's usually a little bit tighter than I want, and by smoothing it should fill that in a little bit. After I've smoothed that out, I can continue next, and now we'll get into all of our major steps for our framework. The first of these is the retention grids. Most of these steps are going to work where you can add as many of these items as you want, and to add each one, you have to start by clicking one of the buttons on the left. So we only have our one option for the grids, but I can choose between a couple different grid patterns. I'm going to stick with the uh, circular holes for right now. I'll click that button, and then let's pull up our texture scan again so I can follow along to that. Texture scanning isn't required, but it can be helpful for whoever's doing the designing. Once the line is closed, I can start to make changes just by moving any of the dots around. Or if you want to right click on the line, you can get into a fast editing mode, which is similar to margin marking tools in other parts of the software, where you draw the line wherever you want and it'll adjust itself to match your drawing. Once I'm happy with that, I can just click the button again to add another grid. One thing to note as you draw these lines, we don't really have an undo button, and I can't edit any of the dots right now. So if I were to make a mistake, a misclick, I'm just going to ignore that until I've finished the line. Once I've made my way all the way around, I'll be able to correct that and fix those problems. 
So now that the line is closed, I can move around the dots, right click to remove some of the extra dots, or right click to get into the fast editing mode again, so I can just draw and fix that. After I've finished adjusting both of these lines, I'm not going to hit the next button, I'm going to hit the preview to get some extra options. So we can see the way it's applied the whole pattern that I chose. If I want to change that a little bit, I have to click on one of these dots without moving them. So I'm just going to quickly click on one of those. What that's done is it's pulled up this extra control point where I can move around where the pattern is being applied and rotate that pattern as needed. Another option you have, if you've clicked on that and where the dot is visible, is if I decide I don't want to use the whole pattern, as long as this is visible, I can go ahead and choose a different pattern and preview again to see what that looks like. And if I want to change this one as well, I'll just simply again click on one of the dots and adjust the pattern as needed. Once I'm happy with my results, I'll hit Next, and then continue on to the major connector step. So at this point, and every step forward, I'll still be able to add as many different objects as I want, as long as in the end, every object is in some way connected to everything else. So the first one I'm going to draw is the major connector itself, with our first button on the left. I'll start drawing just like before, drawing around, and if I make a mistake I have to ignore it for now. But once I get close to the grids, and uh, one of the teeth that's going to have a rest on it, I'm going to draw very specifically. So I'm going to extend a little bit of the way into the area, so I make sure I've got a strong piece of the major connector to attach to that rest. And I'm going to go just a little bit inside of the grid to make sure that's got a strong connection. If I were to draw this major connector line outside of the grid, it will have a little bit of a space in between the two. So just make sure there's a little bit of overlap between everything you're drawing. After you've made your way all the way around, and your line is closed, you can, just like before, modify this however you want, right-click to get into the fast editing mode, and continue and draw as needed. Before I continue next, though, there are a couple other shapes that I can add. If I were doing a lower arch and I didn't need a major connector shape, I could instead just do a bar shape, but I don't need that for this case. I can also use this button to add occlusal rests. This works just the same as the other tools I've been using. I'll just draw a line that acts as the rest, and just keep going, overlapping what's already there, and continue back until I'm finished and close the circle with our first dot. There is another way of adding occlusal rests at a later step, so I'm going to leave behind this one for right now. Some people prefer to use either this tool or the later tool. The other option I have is our window, so I'm going to draw this palatal opening. Just like before, just keep clicking your way around until you've made your way back to the beginning and close the circle.
after you've finished all of these different pieces, just like before, I'm going to hit the preview button before I continue forward. Because we're drawing over such a large area of the scan data, and it, it can be somewhat sensitive to anything that may have been scanned uh, with a hole or anything like that. So I just want to preview to make sure it's not creating any strange shapes before I continue forward. I don't see anything off, so I'll just continue next. We're going to add most of the remaining pieces as clasps. They do give you a bunch of different types of clasps that you can add, but all in all, these are all pretty much the same shape. So I'm going to be using just the G clasp for everything. Regardless of which of these you use, you're still able to adjust things like thickness and depth for every component you're adding. When I draw these, however, it's going to be a little bit different from some of the other tools we've been using. So I'll click that button just like before to start drawing, but I'm not drawing a circle anymore, I'm drawing just a single line. So I'll keep clicking points all through wherever I want that clasp to be. But once I'm finished, I can't really close the circle. I have to click a second time on my final dot to save this. And then I can see the clasp shape it's, uh, it's creating. To adjust this, I can click on any of these dots to move them around. Right click and delete a, a point if possible, or if needed. And if I wanted to change the size to this, I can use either the shift or the control key on the keyboards. If you hold shift and hover over one of these dots, it tells you the width, and I can use the scroll wheel to adjust that size. Control tells you the depth, and I can use the scroll wheel again to control that depth. If I want to add a taper to this, you can actually use those tools at the same time. So I'm going to hold down both control and shift on the keyboard and just scroll this down to a tapered point. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, and now it's got a nice taper to it. So just like before, tapering down most at the point and then just reducing it gradually from there. You can also use this, uh, these clasps to create the rests. So I'm going to use another line that's acting just as the rest, drawing roughly around the middle of this rounded section, working my way down till it's overlapping with the major connector, and clicking on my final dot to save that. From here, I'm not really going to adjust the depth so much, I'm just going to adjust the width mainly. So I'll widen that a little bit with that shift and scroll wheel. And then I might adjust the depth a little bit with control and scroll wheel. Keep in mind that this portion of the software is not going to automatically maintain a minimum thickness for you. So it's up to you to make sure that you're keeping this, uh, this RPD for, at the right thickness for whatever material you plan on producing it in. So I'll continue adding clasps, working my way around. You're free to add these clasps wherever you want, as long as in the end they're connected with the rest of the RPD. So, in addition to that, if I want to add something like an eye bar or a roach clasp, I'm going to use the same exact tools, draw one line as the clasp itself, 
and then draw another line to act as the jumper bar. And just work your way back up to the rest of the RPD. Again, it gives you complete freedom to draw whatever you need as long as in the end everything's connected. If you're drawing other pieces similar to using that, uh, that rest from before, Try not to make right angles with these clasps. Instead of drawing one line that works my way up and then wraps around this lingual side that's been prepped, it generally kind of makes a weird shape with the way it creases the corners. So instead of doing that, I'm going to draw one line that acts as this connector here, and then a second line for the clasp itself. And no matter what you're drawing, as long as it's all overlapping in the end, it should be fine. So if it does happen where you've drawn something and it may not have been all the way connected, let's do this as an example. The error you'll get will say that not all elements have been attached or are overlapping. So all parts of the frame must be connected to each other in some way. If you haven't noticed it while you're in the middle of designing, an easy way to locate where the problem area is is just to turn off the scan so you can see any pieces that aren't overlapping. So I just have to move my dots around or create a new line so everything lines up connected and then continue next. After it's applied all of the clasps, it gives you your sculpting tools with your plus, minus, and smooth to try and clean up any of the connections between these units. You can see wherever I've had an overlap, it always makes a little bit of a crease. So I'm just going to use the smooth tool a little bit, clean up all of those pieces. Just keep in mind that wherever you're smoothing, again, it's not maintaining a minimum thickness. Especially if you smooth near the grids, it can completely wipe those away. So I'm going to try and stay away from those sections. I mostly use this step just to clean up all the different creases between clasps and major connectors. After you've smoothed out everything you need, you can continue next to our finishing line step. It always automatically gives you a preview of where it thinks the line should be, based on where you drew your grid at the first stage. So I'm just going to draw this line, and you don't have to follow it exactly. You can still draw the line wherever you know it needs to be. And click a second time on your final dot to save that line. So I'll click that button again and add our second finishing line. Click a second time on my final dot. And if it happens like this, where the line seems to be facing the wrong direction, you can just right-click anywhere on the line and hit the reverse spline option to just flip that to the other side. Once that's drawn wherever you need it to be, you can continue next, and we have just a couple more steps remaining. It starts us off with another sculpt step. The only thing that's changed since the previous sculpting step is the finishing lines, so that's usually the only thing I focus on with the plus, minus, and smooth tools at least. So I'll usually use this to just smooth out this gradient uh, around the 
finish line just to get rid of kind of the rougher edge that it's made. But you do have to be careful because the smooth tool will allow you to smooth away the line itself. So just be careful where you're using it. The other tool I have at this stage is this paintbrush icon. It's highlighted uh, most of the major connector in red. This is the area where it's going to be applying a stippled wax texture if we want to. If you needed it to be applied in more areas, I'll just use the plus sign to make sure that's painted across a larger area. Or I'd use the minus to get rid of some areas so it doesn't wind up with a stippled wax texture. Once that's defined wherever you need it to be, you can continue next to our final step for changes. The last three things we can add here are tissue stops, bars, and the stippled wax texture itself. For the tissue stops, you'll just click the button on the left and click anywhere on the grid where you want that to be. So we'll just click anywhere on that surface and it's going to add a 4 millimeter diameter tissue stop. For the support bars, there are some milling processes where you might want to add extra support during the milling process, but most people tend to use these support bars as sprues for the investment process. To do this, I'm going to click on the support bar, click on one spot where I want that to be on the bar, and then with the scan off, I want to click somewhere in empty space to place that. You can then move this around wherever you need, but be careful about where you're looking from. If I'm moving this around and I let go where my mouse is over the surface of the scan, that's the surface it's now connected to. But if I move around where my mouse is in empty space, it should be connected in another way. So whenever I'm letting go of my mouse, I just want to make sure that I'm not hovering over a piece of my design so that it doesn't wind up connecting to it instead of just raising it. So just keep adjusting for multiple angles till it's at the right height and position that you want. You can then add more pieces, so I'll draw another line and click and it should snap to any existing bars that you've made. Once you've done that, you can still move it around to adjust it as needed, and you can adjust the thickness as needed. As you hover over the bar, it has all of these different dots which you can use the scroll wheel to adjust the width or thickness of. The last thing I can change is our stippled wax. By default, right now it's set to none, so it would leave the major connector surface untouched. But there are a bunch of different options we have in here. The difference between the medium, fine, and coarse options aren't really very different. The, all they're doing is changing the size or the scale of the texture that's being applied. The three main textures are these one, two, and three options. One is generally going to be a somewhat veined texture, whereas two and three are a little bit more rough of a pattern. Most people tend to use two or three. And I'll just preview to see what that result looks like. So now we can see it's added that texture to that surface. It's kept the bars attached, and we can see the tissue stops that have been added as well. After that, you'd be finished with your design. You can hit next, and it takes you to the save step of the process.